So let's talk about crucial conversations. Um, this is part two of our discussion on crucial conversations. Here's our book. Um, it is Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When Stakes Are High. Uh, it's by Joseph Granny, Kerry Patterson, Ron McMillan, Al Schweitzler, and uh, Emily. I didn't catch that last one on there uh, because they've added, they've added some new stuff in the third uh, edition. Um, anyways, um, this is Why Stories Matter, and this book has impacted... Um, this, this book has really impacted the way we think at the Gospel Rescue Mission, the way that w- our programs are designed. And, um, and last week we talked about our path to action, um, and we're going to build on that. Why mastering stories matter. And this is just more, more lessons that we've learned and applied. Uh, so our path to action, our observations, goes like this, our observations lead to questions. Okay, and questions are answered by stories. Most frequently, those stories are told by ourselves. So our stories determine how we feel, and our feelings determine how we act. Now, if this is true, and we're convinced that it is, then here's our, here's our end goal. The action of urban camping and homelessness, uh, in other words, is, excuse me, is the result of stories, stories that people tell themselves. And, um, and let's talk about how we get there and why we need to make changes here. So first of all, if, if we don't have these crucial conversations, if we're not able to have conversations about difficult things, then what it results in is it results in silence or violence. And, and by its very nature, um, homelessness is is an evidence of relational brokenness. It's an inability to hold crucial conversations. So some ideas of silence um, are things like masking, um, the sarcasm and sugarcoating. You know, why are they out there? Well, it's okay. I'm fine. I can survive. I'm doing just fine uh, living out here in my tent. Um, avoidance. Uh, they will just avoid talking about anything but what's important. So when you're talking to the homeless person who's holding up the sign and you go, hey, um, why are you, why don't you go stay at the mission? And the, the last thing they want to do is talk about why they don't want to get out of their homeless situation. And then, of course, uh, withdrawal. Withdrawal is just a completely pulling away from the conversation entirely. So you've got these people that are isolating and getting away from social interaction. Why? Because there's difficult conversations that come with social interaction. The other is violence, okay? The, so the, the, if they're unable to have these crucial conversations, they become controlling, okay? And they use coercion and uh, and hyperbole. So um, things like, I will just camp in your city parks. We will just decide to do exactly what, uh, what you don't want us to do if you don't give us our way. And here's the hyperbole, because I have nowhere else to go and I'm going to die. Okay. Um, labeling. How about the labeling that goes on in the in the homeless community and towards homelessness in general? Um, what we do, we move to violence and we label people. We label them things like tweakers or bums. We label them as all being addicts or mentally ill. And all of these are ways of dismissing somebody because you begin to dehumanize them. Um, we also can move to violence by just simple attacking. I mean, so... Um, homeless camps are basically just not safe, and they become these people who are disengaged from uh, good conversations and unable to have good conversations end up doing things like yelling obscenities at people who are walking through the park, vandalizing the park, stealing from the neighborhood around them, and of course there's always just physical harm that comes as well from uh, one person to another. So really what we need to do is we need to create a mission of making conversations safe. And one of the ways we do this is by focusing on mutual purpose. So 
at the Gospel Rescue Mission, when somebody comes to the mission, the thing that we try and focus on is the thing that this we, we create this mutual purpose. They do not want to remain homeless, and we also do not want for them to remain homeless. So leaving homelessness for good is our mutual purpose. And we're safe because we just stick to that conversation. We, th- we stick to the things that are that are that we've committed to together. Um, we, we engage them with a contract to commit to that purpose. So we are saying, hey, look, you came to us saying you wanted to leave homelessness behind. These are the things that it takes to, to do that in our facility. And, and would you agree with that? And they, in the, from entry all the way through their program, they say, yes, we're interested in committing to that contract, that we are willing to do these things in order to leave homelessness behind. Um, but not only are we committed to that, to that contract on the front end, but we also revisit it, and we revisit it on a regular basis. Another thing that we do is we're respecting choices. So, um, so we go both past and present choices. What we do is we give them the respect that they deserve. So when somebody has made bad choices, we're not scorning them for them, but we're talking about the the the, the validity of of the choices they made, why they made them that way, the decisions that they made. Of course, you know, we'll say something like when someone tells us, "Man, I started using drugs when I was 13 years old," and when we start finding out about how did they. How was their life at 13 years old? And we hear the hideous nature of, of, you know, their home life and everything. We think, you know, I think I might have decided to use drugs if I were raised in that home life as well. Um, and, and so those were the choices we made as a child, but we don't have to continue making them as an adult. Um, so we talk about both past and present. We talk about helpful and harmful choices. The choices to stay in this program or the choices to leave our program. Both of those, we respect those. We don't, we don't scorn somebody for leaving our program. We just go, okay, you know, this is your choice and this is what it's going to, um, this is going to be the result of that choice. Uh, brainstorming. We regularly revisit our plans uh, towards achieving our purpose together our purpose, our plans that we that we come up with together, we revisit them regularly. We both check in and say, hey, is this still what you want? Are you still looking to leave homelessness behind? Do you agree that these are the best next steps to get there? And uh, and we work that we work that line and, and there's safety within that line. And so now Clever stories that derail relationships. One of the things that we have to do when we're talking to somebody who's first coming in off of the streets in, uh, into our program is we're listening for clever stories that derail relationships. These are things that are really common, um, and they're things that are like victim stories. Victim stories, it's not my fault, um, is, a, is a victim story. Um, we'll hear it in ways like, oh, my ex left me, um, or uh, it's in my DNA, or someone stole my stuff, or I ran out of money. Um, these kinds of things are all victim stories, and uh, we're listening for them because we want to help empower them. We want to, we want to be able to turn them into victor stories. We want to get them to where they can work their way out of those. Villain stories. Um, it's not. It's all their fault. We hear this kind of uh, in, in terms of like, uh, my boss was a jerk, or there's just too many greedy landlords out there, or she just knows how to push all my buttons, uh, or or if you're out in if you're out in uh, you know out in the homeless camps and you ask why don't you go to the mission? Well, they all have too many rules. Um, so so these are the kind of stories that we would hear um, in the villain stories, and and uh, it's somebody else's fault. That's how I got here. Um, and then we'll hear the helpless stories. Helpless stories is uh, there's nothing else I can do. I just can't quit. Um, these stories of helplessness that um, that make these people, they lead to a person st- just being stuck in a homeless camp, in a tent, in a car, sitting there, and if the longer that they believe these stories, these stories will lead to 
homelessness. They're the things that are, that are doing that. And why clever stories? Well, why, why do they use these clever stories? Because they're close to reality. Um, they're hard to distinguish from the truth. So, so the closer that they are to reality, if a story has pieces of reality in it, um, but not all of reality, then, then they're going to sound really, really close to true. And that can be uh, really helpful if I want to get off the hook of responsibility. So they, they're part of the stories that get me off the hook of my responsibility. I'm just a victim. Hey, man, it's not me. I'm not responsible for my condition. Um, and they help me avoid acknowledging my bad choices. So again, um, if I've got these victim stories, if I've got these helpless stories, I can always just say, well, it's not me. Um, and, and I don't have to look at the, the things that I did along the way that led to my homelessness. Now, many stories are simply not true, okay? Um, and those are things that you just have to listen for. Um, stories that are not true such as this. Uh, homelessness is all about addiction and mental health problems. Now, there is addiction and mental health problems related to homelessness, but it is the homelessness is all about this big, broad brush, and then it's all about addiction and mental health problems. Um, and here are some of the assumptions behind these things, and you have to listen for that. Um, they're saying, when somebody says homelessness is all about this, uh, and particularly about mental health and addiction issues, they're saying that they are insurmountable. Okay, They're arguing that these are problems that cannot be overcome. Uh, oftentimes, they're saying only the government can fix these issues, okay? And they'll say that by, the, the implication is, is, well, we've wrecked the mental health institutions, and therefore all these mental health people are out uh, in, the, in the streets. And, and neither are true. Um, I mean, yes, the, we did change the mental health institutions across our country, but um, it's not all there is to be said. It's an oversimplification. And there are great mental health uh, organizations that are being that are doing great work in these things, and um, and then the idea that only the government can fix the issues. I mean, I got to tell you, when I look at I, when I look at our senators and congressmen and governors and you know and and even down to city council members, I'm not confident that they are people that are qualified to make that even even that decision as to how to solve mental health issues. Um, and what's the best choice and what's the best way? Um, I'd rather see them build a bridge or, or uh, fill a pothole or build infrastructure or pay for police, you know, policing and stuff. These are things that they are very good at and have been doing well for a long time. Mental health things are not getting better, I don't see. And uh, that yet there is, as we've already read in our news article today, there's literally, we're spending more on it in this last decade than we've ever spent on it as a nation. And uh, we're getting a bad result. Um, so I don't know that government's qualified to fix these issues. Um, another one is uh, homelessness. This is a, a story that's simply not true. Homelessness is a result of high rent. Okay? Let me just flat out contradict that. No, it's not, okay? It's not a result of high rent. And here is the assumptions. And I'm not saying that there's not high rent. Good grief. Mortgage payments and high rent and all this stuff are through the roof right now at a, at a time, at, a, at a, a rate that's higher than any of us could have ever imagined. But here are some assumptions that he's saying. It's, it's assuming that a homeless person can afford and manage a low rent. You're saying if you just got the if if we just brought the price down, everybody'd be in a house. Not true. It's just not necessarily true. Uh, you might have some of them come into a house, but low rent or high rent, uh, a lot of these folks that are coming in, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it be um, they're all mentally ill and all addicts, and have them able to manage a low rent. Um, how about this? A homeless person. The, the assumption that a homeless person can acquire and keep a job or income stream. I mean, our, one of our biggest focuses here in the mission is just to develop 
the income stream, to develop a stable income stream for folks. And that takes time. Helping them manage their finances. A lot of the folks that we've seen that are homeless really have gotten there because they weren't good at managing their income stream. So this has played a huge role into this. And these are big assumptions that are, follow from just saying it's a rental issue. Um, it's, just a, it's just a not helpful broad brush. So we got to get our stories to reflect reality. And that comes by asking better questions. So Here's some questions that we should be asking. Am I pretending not to notice my role in this problem? Um, it, it's, a, it's a thing that we see a lot of times with uh, people who come in through our doors who've been homeless for a while is they blame everybody else and, and you focus on the injustices that everybody else has had in their lives, but what we haven't done is said, but why did you choose to have this person in your life? Why did you choose to, um, to, to drink when you knew that drinking was going, that, that one beer was going to lead to 15 beers? Um, why did you choose to, you know, to, to move to Oregon in, where, it's, where the rent is exceedingly high as opposed to, say, Oklahoma, where the rent is exceedingly low. Um, so these kinds of things, why am I pretending not to notice my role in the problem? Here's another one. Why would a reasonable, rational, decent person make this choice? Now, now this is one that if we just... If we just Take everybody in our lives that we've seen that make broken decisions or decisions that we don't understand, and we and we reduce them to um, to tweaker, to to addict, to to villain somehow. Um, then we we miss learning about why somebody makes a decision, and what it does is we dehumanize them by so so then we can just kind of more easily dismiss them. So we have to take people and go, let's humanize them again. Let's ask, why would a reasonable, rational, and decent person make that choice? And then we'll get to a better answer uh, as far as finding out how did we get here. Um, And then here's a question that's a good thing to ask. What do I really want? So if 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 you're dealing with somebody who who is asking you for money uh, because they're homeless, and you're going to you're thinking, do I give them money? Do I give them food? What do I really want? What do I really want for them? Um, well, what I really want for them is to for them not to be homeless again, for them to not need money from me, but for them to have money of their own. And my giving them five dollars doesn't necessarily help them get to that spot. So, um, so I have to think for this bigger picture: what is it that I'm really looking for, and what will that goal require? Uh, what's it going to take for me to get to that spot that I really want? to see for this person in their life. Correct stories lead to correct actions. Um, And we often, here's the funny thing, we often are the least qualified person to answer the question that we ask ourselves about our observations. So last week we talked about uh, the story of a person sitting in, uh, coming out of a theater and seeing their car at the end of the parking lot and it's dark outside and there's a, there's a dark hooded figure standing out by, the, uh, by a, a, a light post out in the parking lot. And we see, the, we see them there and we go, why is that person there? And then we tell ourselves, well, that person's going to try and jump me between me and my car. Or we tell ourselves, hey, look at there. The, uh, the theater must have hired security to get me safely from here to there. We're asking ourselves the question. We're the least qualified person to answer to, to answer the question. We don't know why that person's there. We should have gone in and asked the, the theater staff, Hey, did you see that there was this person out here? Um, and let them answer 
Why do we do this? So how many times do you do that when you're, when you're just talking to your spouse, maybe? Why is she slamming the door like that? Why is she using that tone of voice? And then we answer our own question, well, because she doesn't like me, or she's mad at me, or I've done something wrong, or, or instead of going, hey, I, I noticed that you closed that door a little loud. Uh, is there something wrong? And she might have gone, well, it got stuck, and you know, I just couldn't close it right, so I had to slam it. If we ask the right person, then we might get a better answer and a more complete answer, which is what we build our story on, which is what determines how we feel, which is what determines how we act. Um, So a commitment to gathering better data for my story can change my story entirely. Ownership of our role in, in a crucial situation can empower, change, and turn our focus from fault to responsibility. And this helps us to move from helplessness to able. Okay. So I'm no longer, I'm no longer helpless, but I'm able. And and we do this by, by talking to folks and going, you know, look, my hurt as a child was not my fault, but my healing is my responsibility. My spouse's relapse is not my fault, but my sobriety is my responsibility. Here's the bottom line. Homelessness is not a necessary outcome. The Bible says, Jesus says in the Bible, in John 8, 31 and 32, he says, If you abide in my words, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What we're trying to help people with is freedom from despair, isolation, poverty, bondage, and abuse. And, and we know that it is possible. Mental wellness and homefulness can be restored. And this correct story exchanges feelings of despair with hope and even joy. It's no wonder why mission residents become successful citizens. And, um, and these are some of the things that we've learned from Crucial conversations, um, they are tools for talking when stakes are high. There's a link to this book in our, uh, in our show notes. And if this is the kind of thing that would interest you, uh, this is a great book for all kinds of relationships and relational issues, whether it's you're in the workplace or in your home or certainly uh, here in our Gospel Rescue Mission, where crucial conversations, conversations that are important and significant and need to happen, and they happen all the time.